The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss therapies given during surgery. This webinar is funded in part by GT Medical Technologies. My name is Ambreen Mann, Program Manager here at the ABTA, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Dr. John Bukvar is the Director of the Brain Tumor Center and the Pituitary Neuroendocrine Center at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. He is also an investigator at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research, where he directs the Laboratory for Brain Tumor Biology and Therapy. Dr. Bukvar is internationally known for his surgical expertise and for, for, for providing patients with safe, effective, and minimally invasive treatment for brain tumors, skull-based disorders, and disorders of the spine. He has been recognized for his novel research in brain tumors and stem cell biology, and has received numerous national awards, including the Eric Lichtenstein Humanitarian Award for his compassionate work in treating patients with brain cancer. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Bukvar. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Ambreen, and thank you to the American Brain Tumor Association and to GT Medical for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Ambreen, you talk beautifully and very slowly, so I'm going to try to use you as a model for how I speak during this webinar. The webinar today is first a, a disclaimer. The webinar today is on therapies giving during brain tumor surgery. I have no financial interest in anything that I'm presenting. I do not get paid for any clinical trial that I'm an investigator in, and I have no financial relationship with GT Medical or no financial interest in any uh, procedure, therapy, or medication that we're discussing today. I additionally have no consulting or advisory board agreements to report. I do have a preclinical basic science laboratory that is run at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research, where we do basic science research on tissue derived from human brain tumors. I do not have clinical trial support for the clinical trials that I will be discussing today. So as stated, the discussion today is on therapies giving during surgeries for brain tumors. And this is a large topic, and we'll have plenty of time at the end to answer any of your questions. The clinical problem that I am focusing on here is glioblastoma multiforme. These are primary central nervous system tumors that we know some things about, and there are some things we're still trying to understand. Gliomas in general are a broad base of tumors that come from the brain. They are different than metastatic tumors that come from other parts of the body and metastasize or travel to the brain. In the picture in the top right, you see a glioblastoma that is actually coming out through the surface of the brain. Glioblastoma is a grade four cancer. Now the statistics haven't really changed much in the last couple of decades. However, I'm happy to report, and I will show you recent data that suggests that we are moving the needle, albeit slowly, to improve survival of patients with glioblastoma. In fact, as you see here, the two-year survival now for patients with some types of glioblastoma is 25%, and we're seeing more and more patients with five-year survival. How do we do that? We do good surgery, we follow surgery with radiation and a pill called temozolomide, which is given during radiation. Additionally, that pill, temozolomide or temodar, is given for either six months or to a year following your first operation for glioblastoma. So the standard treatment for glioblastoma is surgery. Now, it used not to be that case. Currently, we know, and I'm gonna show you data from this week that shows that the more tumor you take out, the longer a patient lives. Now, the reason why that's important and the reason why it's important for today's discussion is 
if every patient now is getting safe surgery, are there additional treatments we can do during surgery or in that surgical time frame that can improve a patient's survival? So the standard treatment includes maximal surgical resection of the tumor. That includes areas surrounding the tumor as long as it is in a safe area of the brain. A safe area of the brain is an area of the brain where the patient will not wake up with a neurological deficit. For example, the patient won't be blind, the patient won't be weak in the arm or the leg, et cetera. After surgery, after approximately four weeks for the wound to heal, the patient will then start the standard STUP, S-T-U-P-P protocol, which consists of six weeks of radiation therapy and chemotherapy. So this is the standard treatment for glioblastoma. As you can see in the bottom here, as of two weeks ago, February 6, 2020, in a major medical journal, we have additional evidence that surgery improves survival for patients with glioblastoma. Now that's a very important thing I'm just gonna repeat. Surgery improves survival for patients with glioblastoma. So this study confirms an association between maximal resection of tumor and overall survival in patients with glioblastoma across all subtypes. And that's important to know because patients often are fixated on whether they have particular mutations, whether it's MGMT or IDH1. It doesn't matter if the patient gets a maximal resection of the tumor as seen on MRI scan, the patient has a better chance for survival. So a great paper they're all very proud of and uh, should help um, uh, navigate uh, future treatments in, in glioblastoma. This is that STOOP protocol paper, also from the New England Journal of Medicine, a top journal, which proved that the addition of temozolomide to radiation therapy for newly diagnosed glioblastoma is clinically meaningful and statistically significant. And as you can see in the bottom right, the blue line indicates that more and more people, up to 20% of people, are living longer and longer. Our slogan at Lenox Hill Neurosurgery in the Brain Tumor Center is we strive for five. Every patient, we strive for five. We wanna get that patient to the five-year mark because we believe that after that point, we've altered the course and biology of that patient's disease, and we wanna make that patient uh, a long-term survivor. So here you can see in this picture, uh, my left is the patient's right. Uh, this patient has a right occipital glioblastoma on a MRI scan. And this is what we talk about, the STU protocol. TMZ stands for temozolomide, and RT stands for radiation therapy. And across weeks one through six, they get six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, followed by a break of four weeks. And then the patient continues on five days in blue with Temodar and 23 days off, and that's repeated by, for six cycles or 12 cycles. Unfortunately, this is what happens in the majority of patients. There is a recurrence in the area of the brain tumor, and this 90% of patients, this occurs within two centimeters of that original tumor. Here's the original tumor, here's the recurrence. So we know that 90% of the time, that tumor is gonna come back locally. So once we know that nine out of 10 patients are gonna recur locally, is that an indication for treating something, the tumor during surgery to prevent local recurrence? I've studied the blood-brain barrier since I was at Penn and Cornell and now at Feinstein and uh, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. The blood-brain barrier is extremely important. And frankly, it is the holy grail of brain tumor research. The blood-brain barrier was evolutionarily derived to prevent things in our bloodstream from getting into the brain. Now that may be good if you're bit by a boa constrictor, but it's bad if you're trying to get drugs into the brain if you have a brain tumor. So we must think of modalities where we bypass the blood-brain barrier and get drugs or devices into the brain in patients with brain tumors so we can better treat 
the disease. This is another study that sh uh, picture that shows we have many mechanisms and they're labeled here one, two, three, and four, where we use technologies to bypass the blood brain barrier. My uh, institution and I've been studying enhancing drug permeability and disrupting the blood brain barrier numbers one and two in the diagram by using intra arterial drug delivery techniques to bypass the blood brain barrier to get high doses of drugs, particularly big drugs that we have on the shelves uh, into the patient's brain tumor. In numbers three and four, my colleagues are using a technology with catheters where they're implanting catheters into brain tumors. That technology is called convection enhanced delivery. And additionally, we'll be talking a little bit about implantable wafers and sometimes devices that are called polymer systems. Where, which release chemotherapies and are left in the surgical cavity by the surgeon after removing the brain tumor. At our institution, uh, I've been studying ways to bypass the blood-brain barrier using intra-arterial drug delivery. These are technologies where we look at the blood supply as noted in this diagram by my colleagues, Rafael Ortiz and David Langer. They are navigating the blood vessels around a brain tumor with microcatheters that are in inserted into the groin of a patient. By doing this, we don't have to open the skull. We spare the patient having open surgery. And we can open the blood-brain barrier using simple sugars called mannitol and deliver high doses of drug into the brain tumor. Here you can see a patient with a thalamic brain tumor in white on the image in the left and my endovascular neurosurgeon picking the blood vessels that he thinks are best suited to disrupt and give uh, blood-brain barrier disrupting techniques to, to enhance the delivery of drugs to this brain tumor. We're pleased to have started this uh, technology about a year ago when I was at New York Presbyterian, and we've continued that after very promising data showed an improvement in overall survival. We just released in April of this year uh, at the American Association of Neurological Surgery um, Conference that in our newly diagnosed patients who've gotten upfront intra-arterial Avastin, our median over sur overall survival, that means the middle number of uh, patients was 3.2 years. That means 50% of patients lived longer than 3.2 years. Very exciting data with minimally invasive treatments. Here you can see an example of one patient. On the left of your screen, you see a tumor. In this patient, the tumor is white. And uh, six years later, after our treatment, the tumor essentially melted away to nothing. This patient never had surgery. So these are ways where we can use technologies that are um, uh, obviate the need for uh, opening the skull. Here you can see a patient, and we can do this with children with pediatric brainstem gliomas as well. And here is an example of a pediatric brainstem glioma. Pictured on the left in the middle of the uh, film is a white cauliflower-like image. And on the right, you see multiple examples of a microcatheter the size of a hair uh, being threaded up into the patient's brain and uh, the picture in letter D shows drug being distributed solely into the brainstem of this patient. So those are some technologies that we can do around the time of surgery, before surgery, we can do it right after surgery, and we can do it months after surgery. There are certain things we've started to look at what we with um, ideas doing while we're in surgery. And one of them is called intraoperative radiotherapy. Intraoperative radiotherapy, we also uh, shortened by using the term IORT. And here is the Zeiss Intrabeam device. And this device is a robotic device that after we remove a brain tumor, we can insert that robotic device into the surgical cavity and immediately give the patient radiotherapy. So as I mentioned in my introductory slides, the STU protocol includes six weeks of radiotherapy. But that six weeks of radiotherapy doesn't start 
until four weeks after surgery, so we, because we let the wound heal. The idea behind intraoperative radiotherapy and a term called brachytherapy, which I'll highlight shortly, is you're not giving the tumor cells any time to rest. You're immediately radiating the cavity where the brain tumor was with this device. So you're providing radiation to the tumor bed immediately after surgery, hopefully, hopefully uh, preventing cells from duplicating and growing back. And this study was done uh, with Frank Giordano. He was essentially the leader in this technology. And this showed that dose escalation um, could provide um, significant, was essentially safe. It was tolerable to the brain tissue. One of the biggest risks of radiation therapy is if you give too much radiation therapy, you don't want to melt the normal brain tissue adjacent to it, and that's called radiation necrosis. If you're giving radiation with an uh, intrago device or intraoperative radiotherapy, is there a higher risk when added to standard radiation of radiation necrosis? And what Dr. Giordano and his team in Germany has shown that indeed, IORT or the Intrago intraoperative radiotherapy device in glioblastoma in conjunction with STU protocol did uh, have a favorable safety profile and manageable toxicity. Now, what that means is they were able to identify doses that they deemed safe anywhere from 20 to 40 gray, essentially low dose of radiation therapy had manageable toxicity. Now patients will should ask the question and make sure that they understand that any type of radiation can have side effects. So if your brain tumor is in your speech area and you get radiation therapy and you have swelling radi related to that radiation therapy, there's a chance that your speech could get worse from that treatment. So even though we think of these as treatments, they can have side effects. And so it's important to discuss with your provider what the risks of those side effects are. And when it comes to radiation therapy uh, and intra intraoperative radiotherapy, radiation necrosis um, is um, one of those um, side effects. This slide has moved my circle, but the, the red circle does, uh, we are a participant in at Lenox Hill Hospital, you see I'm one of the investigators that is trialing um, the intraoperative radiotherapy device uh, from Zeiss. And the, the other things I want to talk about as far as inclusion criteria, we want to um, emphasize that the IORT intrabeam radiotherapy device is reserved for patients we believe we can get a near total or gross total resection. Now remember I showed you that slide in the beginning that showed the data suggests we want to be as aggressive as possible and take out um, as much tumor as possible and that is the case as long as we do it safely. In those patients where I can get a near total or gross total resection, those are the best cases to bring in um, intraoperative radiotherapy with the intrabeam uh, device. So in summary, and this is part of a clinical trial, the uh, cost of this uh, treatment is inclusive in the clinical trial. And um, obviously we, we want you to ask your providers here, you can see a list of uh, 16 investigators. And of course, if there's ever a question, feel free to reach out to me or Ambreen uh, about the, your um, eligibility for any of these clinical trials. So that's IORT, intraoperative radiotherapy. Brachytherapy is a little bit different. And brachytherapy is when we leave behind in the brain something that will help kill the tumor. And many times radioactive agents have been used as brachytherapy agents. These are implants that give off essentially radiation, much like the intrabeam robot, which is brought in on a long arm and then removed. The intrabeam, I'm sorry, the, the brachytherapy technology is 
we leave it in the brain forever. We don't take it out in, in, in modern day um, brachytherapy. There used to be some devices that we um, had reservoirs that we removed after several days, but common day brachytherapy involves leaving an implant in the resection cavity and that will give off radiation and hoping that that radiation would kill any cells that we left behind from surgery and any cell that would have the chance for, for regrowing and causing a relapse of disease. Really one of the most common radioisotopes, and you may have heard of radioactive iodine for patients who have thyroid disease or thyroid cancer. The reason why we give radioactive iodine to those patients is because thyroid cancer cells have iodine receptors on them and they pick up the radioactive iodine when we give it in the bloodstream. If that radioactive iodine is picked up by a thyroid cancer cell, it will kill that cancer cell. If we take that same radioactive iodine and put it on an implant and leave that implant in the patient's brain tumor cavity, we can see release of radiation locally. And that is uh, what many of these studies have done. And there is a long history, really led by Mitch Berger and Philip Guten out of the University of California in San Francisco uh, several years ago, showing that uh, radioactive iodine, iodine-125 brachytherapy, had activity, meaning that it did improve some uh, patient survival with some risk um, for the treatment of, of brain tumor. The biggest risk of any time you implant radioactive iodine um, or any radioisotope uh, for that matter, is that normal cells, particularly healing cells, that, you that are required for healing and incision may be interfered with by the radioactive isotope. So when I open a patient's skull, I have to first open their scalp, then I have to open their skull, and then I have to open the lining of the brain called the dura, and then I actually have to open the li uh, another lining of the brain called the pia, and then I'm in the brain. Now, if I leave a radioactive isotope like iodine-125 in that patient's surgical cavity, Yes, it may kill residual glioblastoma cells, but it may be also hurting cells that need to divide that are inflammatory or immune cells or healing cells that are healing that pia, that dura, that skull, or the scalp. And so the side effects from, from these radioactive implants, if you will, the biggest side effect, and the biggest risk is infection. We see patients who have wound-related infections. So whether we're talking about radioactive iodine, I'm going to talk a little bit about gliadel, I'm going to talk about cesium. These are all predicated on the same idea, and really the risks are the same. So gliadel, many of you have heard about. Gliadel is an implantable, unlike the radioactive iodine, gliadel is a chemotherapy wafer developed by Henry Brem and his colleagues at Johns Hopkins. So instead of having a radioactive isotope implant, this basically has a chemotherapy implant. And the chemotherapy here is carmustine, and, and um, this is given in a wafer tablet that's a, uh, smaller than a dime. And based upon the size of the surgical cavity, these gliadel wafers are put in the surgical cavity. And the idea of these, uh, these implants are that these polymers, or these little discs that you see, basically are little tab tablets that degrade over two weeks. And with that, erosion of the tablet releases a chemotherapy called BCNU. And what is BCNU? It's a, it's a chemotherapy called carmustine. And many of you have heard of the oral pill lumustine or CCNU, which is a well-known treatment for glioblastoma we take by mouth. So instead of taking that pill by mouth, you're basically putting this pill directly at the site of the surgical cavity. And I just wanna bring your attention to that original image that I went back and forth 
of that patient's brain tumor, that 90% of brain tumors recur locally, these implantation technologies that we employ during surgery is our effort to reduce local recurrence. And if we can get BCNU re, um, released in that surgical cavity, we may have a better chance at delaying the recurrence of patients with glioblastoma. Here you can see an uh, animation of gliadel wafer implantation. The, the, the brain has been opened and you will be seeing some intraoperative imaging uh, here. So if you're squeamish, uh, the, some of these slides may, may, may be a little raw. But these are the, the uh, gliadel wafers that we implant in the surgical cavity. Again, the average amount of wafers that we can implant are about seven and eight. They degrade, the capsule degrades over about two weeks and releases uh, the active, excuse me, chemotherapy agent. What are the risks of this procedure? The same thing we talked about. There is uh, a chance that the patient can have worsening wound healing related issues because again, the chemotherapy impacts the natural healing capacities of the normal brain and the lining of the brain called the pia, the dura, the skull, and the scalp. So your provider needs to be very, very attentive to how the wound looks. Is there leaking from the wound? Do you have a fever after surgery? Is there cellulitis or redness of the scalp? Uh, those are things that are very, very important. Dr. Brem and his colleagues and others have shown with the implantation um, of gliadel wafers in multiple studies that survival was improved, albeit by a couple of months, that uh, overall survival was improved in patients who had implantation of the gliadel wafer as compared to those who did not. And therefore the treatment has been approved uh, and is fully covered uh, by Medicare and uh, CMS, and therefore is uh, required to be covered by your insurance provider should your doctor choose to implant um, gliadel. One of the contraindications to gliadel placement is, is your tumor close to the spinal fluid? If your tumor is close to the ventricles, or the spinal fluid, your surgeon should not put in the carmustine or gliadel wafer. And that is because you don't want the carmustine in the gliadel wafer to get into the spinal fluid. That can cause a, a significant uh, a neurological issue. And we strongly discourage uh, the placement of gliadel wafers when there is a possibility that materials from the waste, uh, wafer can leak into the spinal fluid. As our technologies have improved, we have looked at other ways of putting um, radioisotopes and even chemotherapies into the brain. We've moved on to other radioisotopes called cesium-131. I like to call these beads on a string. These are indeed the exact same radio beads that are used in the prostate. And we adapted this technology to use them in the brain. Here you can see uh, I have done a minimally invasive surgery with a tube into the patient's brain. And although uh, I think this slide is a little bit better, again, you can see these beads are on a string lining the surgical cavity. I've implanted these beads on a string so that cesium-131 can be released into the adjacent material of the brain so that we can give that patient immediate radiotherapy. Once I close that incision, the patient's radiation has essentially started. This is how uh, you can see me from my radiation doctor, who my radiation medicine specialist is cutting the beads on the string. I've given him the amount that I, uh, the volume of the, of the surgical cavity and he's calculated how much radiation there is. And so we are cutting the beads on a string and putting just enough um, uh, radiation dose into this patient's brain that uh, we believe is safe. This just shows you 
the patient's radiation lines and each color is a certain amount of radiation. The, the pinkish color is the furthest from the surgical side is getting the least amount of radiation. The blue color is getting more. And actually the green little dots are the dots on the string uh, where we're getting the, the most uh, radiation. So we're excited about this technology. Um, We've published on this technology um, about this with uh, patients with brain metastasis. There are trials uh, exploring the efficacy of this uh, in glioblastoma as well. Again, the complication that we, the, the feared complication of any of these radiotherapy implantation devices is wound breakdown. Of course, seizure, swelling, radiation necrosis are all side effects that are possibilities. Uh, but we found that with our experience, these are low. New and exciting uh, derivation of a similar idea is the uh, gametile therapy. Gametile therapy is essentially the meshing of two very common uh, bioabsorbables we use in brain tumors. One of them, like the last slide, is the cesium-131 idea. Essentially picture cesium-131 beads on a string in a flexible collagen tile like you see here. And that allows us a little bit more um, coverage of our surgical cavity. And it also prevents direct contact of the radiation beads from uh, touching the brain. You have a protecting layer, if not like a, the, a pillowcase on a pillow that you're still getting the effects of the pillow without touching the pillow directly. And this can be um, optimized per patient uh, for effective radiation delivery uh, to tumor cells after the surgeon takes uh, the tumor out. They've done some nice trials uh, showing that their, their gamma tile therapy has <clears throat> um, lower rates of radiation-related brain changes. And that's a polite way of saying radiation necrosis, <coughs> excuse me. So again, the one thing we worry about with radiation brachytherapy, external beam radiation like the IORT, excuse me for one moment as I get a drink. Again, we've talked about external berm, uh, beam radiation in the intrabeam IORT device, <clears throat> that's the robot. Traditional brachytherapy uh, devices, uh, much like the uh, radioactive iodine and the cesium. And the gamma tile therapy <clears throat> suggests that they may have a slightly better uh, radiation-related uh, necrosis rates uh, than these other uh, methods. Um, again, local recurrence rates. We talked about 90% of tumors uh, recur locally. We, we have, with the gamma tile therapy, uh, the company has reported very, very uh, favorable local control rates um, compared to traditional uh, therapies, particularly in the, the what we call progression-free stage, so in that early interval. <clears throat> How does it work? We've talked a little bit about these bioresorbable uh, agents. Essentially, 90% of the dose is delivered over the first month. And that first month is when, in traditional surgical cases, we have to wait for the wounds to heal. So the advantage of these therapies are you're now eliminating that first month waiting period. You're killing cells that are left behind immediately. What are the risks of doing that? You're also killing the cells responsible for healing your surgical cavity. So we weigh the risk and benefits of, of these kind of uh, treatments. Here in a patient uh, population with um, high-grade gliomas, they have a, uh, uh, in, in this particular trial, which is a small number of patients, the median time to recurrence was approximately double with the use of uh, gamma, uh, uh, gamma tiles. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna finish up with some newer uh, techniques that we're using uh, with we call surgical tissue flaps to bypass the blood-brain barrier in glioblastoma. And again, these are flaps that we can use as surgeon to put into the patient's brain tumor cavity. 
and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So all of us have scalp material that has a very, very good blood supply. And in C is in Charlie in this picture, you see that I've taken a, a schematic and I show you a hole where I've taken out a patient's brain tumor. Now look what I've done in D here. I've taken that surgical flap and I buried it into the patient's tumor cavity. What that allows me to do during surgery now is now I have a piece of tissue whose blood supply lacks a blood brain barrier because that tissue is derived from outside the brain. And we call this piece of tissue a temporoparietal fascial flap. And this tissue flap in D now can be put into the surgical cavity and the next day I can give that patient a pill or a chemotherapy and instead of worrying about the blood brain barrier, I don't have to worry about it because this flap that is now buried into the patient's brain and brain tumor cavity does not have a blood brain barrier. We were fortunate enough to uh, be allowed by the FDA to uh, open this trial. We opened it last year. We were allowed to trial on 10 patients. Uh, we've treated uh, three so far with outstanding results. And here you can see a patient in A, B, and C uh, who had a very uh, aggressive brain tumor. In the area where our flap was, and I, I can, my, unfortunately my pointer is not working, but um, uh, I will come back to it if anyone has questions. In the area where the flap was laid, which is deep in the portions of the brain that you see in A, B, and C, there was no recurrence of the brain tumor. However, in D, where the patient had a small tumor and that tumor only got radiation therapy, that patient's tumor in that location progressed. And I don't have, I'm not here to profess that that's the reason why one area progresses and one area doesn't. But our hypothesis is such that if you as surgeons can get tissue material that does not have an intact blood-brain barrier into the surgical cavity, we may be able to actively bypass the blood-brain barrier. And I talked to the Embryon about putting this video on uh, the website. I have a video, it's a little bit graphic, so I'm, I'm gonna bypass it for now in the interest of time. But this idea of using your own tissue flaps in to bypass the blood-brain barrier is not new. And even though we just started doing this, um, and frankly, we're the um, leaders and, and uh, the only site in the world right now that is doing this, it's really an old idea, is using your own tissue flaps to bring in blood supply that does not have an intact blood-brain barrier. And one of the areas you can do that is actually using muscle, meaning that you can take muscle from anywhere in the body and put it on the surface of the brain, and those muscle grafts will grow blood vessels that don't have a blood-brain barrier. I know that sounds easy, but no one has really exploited this, and even the NIH in 1986 dropped this idea uh, years ago. Well, we've picked it back up, and we're exploiting this in two very, very exciting clinical trials that we have up here in New York. And the most recent one is using fat from your belly button to bypass the blood-brain barrier. And here you can see a picture, we call that fat omentum. But if you put omentum on the surface of your, the human brain, you can actually grow blood vessels as you can see in numbers one and two. There's blood vessels growing out of the fat that I've plopped on the human brain. And those blood vessels, guess what? They don't have a blood-brain barrier. So they will incorporate with normal brain blood vessels and lack a blood-brain barrier. So I can give this animal or human a, a medication and that medication should seep into the surgical cavity because it does not have to go across the blood-brain barrier picture that I showed you at the beginning of this webinar. So here you can see a picture of Omentum and this is just a, a graphic of how we do this. Omentum is the fat that lines all of our organs in our belly. Here you can see the stomach and the intestines. Well, our surgeons can actually laparoscopically harvest this. We can pull this up to the human brain under the skin, or we can tie it into a vessel in the neck. And as you can see in Charlie, you lay it on the brain or lay it in the cavity of the brain tumor. I know this sounds crazy, but these are techniques that we do in neurosurgery and head and neck surgery almost every week. 
Now we're doing it for patients with glioblastoma. And this is a very, very exciting uh, approach for us where we're taking blood vessels in the omentum. Here you can see a picture of it. Tying it into blood vessels in the neck and all in the hopes that we can bypass the blood brain barrier and bring vessels so we can get drugs and therapeutics into the human brain. But wait, there's more. In the omentum, in your fat, are tons of immune cells. And you've heard of immunotherapy. Well, immunotherapy is all the rage in cancer, except immunotherapy cells don't get into the human brain. That's why immunotherapy agents have not worked for glioblastoma. So Optivo and Keytruda alone do not work for glioblastoma. Why? Because we can't get T cells and macrophages and B cells or dendritic cells into the human brain. Why? Because of that blood-brain barrier. Well, guess what? In your omentum, in your fat, in your belly, are tons of milky spot spots. And milky spots contain a very large amount of immunotherapy cells. So when we show this picture that looks like we're laying fat in the patient's brain tumor cavity, deep within the, this fat are milky spots. This is teeming with lymph lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, macrophages. And our hope is basically that we're introducing cellular therapy with our omentum uh, transfers into the human brain. We are. We just got approval at Lenox Hill Hospital and Northwell Health uh, to trial this in human patients. We're grateful for the trust and the FDA and our Institutional Review Board. Um, this just opened a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we look forward to offering this uh, to our patients. So with that, I'm approaching the 45-minute mark, which I think is where I was supposed to end. I've hopefully covered a host of surgically relevant treatment options for patients that are undergoing surgery for uh, glioblastoma and gliomas. Not every modality is right for every patient. Every patient and family and loved one uh, member should uh, carefully listen to the provider as to the alternatives, benefits, and risks of each and every procedure. It's important to ask the doctor and surgeon uh, what the risks are of each procedure and why. And with that, uh, I believe that the, the field and the surgical armamentarium uh, available to doctors who treat glioblastoma is expanding rapidly and the future remains bright for the treatment of glioblastoma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. We will now take questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please type and submit it using the question box in the webinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will answer questions as time allows. So Dr. Bukvar, um, one question that we have here is for patients who are interested in explore, exploring some of these novel treatments that you've described, um, do you have any any tips that you can share with them, uh, you know, questions to ask, uh, things that they can keep in mind so they can better understand how to broach this topic with their providers and getting referrals for such treatments? I think that's a very good question. And the one of the most important things we see in our patient population and one of the things I'm most proud of is Having providers, and when I when I say providers, I don't just mean surgeons or neuro-oncologists. Frankly, they're often the least receptive to uh, patients asking questions about novel therapies. Nurse practitioners or navigators who can really help um, patients understand what treatments are right for them are is a great starting point. And I'm thrilled to offer some of the best nurse practitioners and nurse navigators anywhere in the country. And organizations like the ABTA or uh, uh, Head for the Cure or ABC Squared or a host of other foundations all provide resources um, that can help patients navigate the very complex network of trying to figure out what therapy is right for them. You know, with Dr. Google, uh, 
you can get just about any answer to any question on the internet and that becomes a dangerous, dangerous thing. What I think is most important is you find a navigator or provider that you trust and with resources like this webinar from the ABTA, uh, don't be shy about emailing and if you have to email me, email me and I'll put you in the hands of the right person in, in the city or country that you're in. But please, there's a, just as, as the internet can be a, a bad resource, the internet is a terrific resource for, get, for reaching out and trying to get help in, help in navigating the complex network of your treatment. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. Another question we have here is asking, how accessible are these treatments to patients? Are they readily available throughout the country? Um, are they covered by insurance? What are other considerations that patients should keep in mind when trying to gain access to these? So I'm gonna answer that question two ways. The, there is good data suggesting that you wanna be treated at a high volume brain tumor center. A new uh, paper just came out that showed people who treat more than 50 brain tumors a year have better survival rates than patients who treat less than 20. And the institutions that were between 20 and 50, it was uh, somewhat uh, unclear if there was a benefit. But there is no doubt that the survival benefit in institutions that treat a high volume of brain tumors, those patients actually live longer. Now, to address your question directly is these therapies tend to be available with providers, one, that are more comfortable treating glioblastoma, that are more comfortable treating brain tumors. And so those institutions, and I'm not talking across the board, I'm talking generally, the higher volume brain tumor centers uh, have these techniques available. Gliadel is universally available. Now, I will tell you that Gliadel wafer, which is a carmustine wafer, is not uniformly accepted by surgeons as worth the risk, meaning that the marginal benefit that was re, uh, related as far as two to three months survival benefit was not worth the risk that wound infection was uh, uh, the potential of and has led to somewhat of a disfavor among neurosurgeons in placing gliadel, okay? Now, there are times that I use gliadel and there are times that I don't. Gliadel is only one drug in our armamentarium. I tend to reserve gliadel for the multiply recurrent patient who has a recurrent, uh, a small volume recurrence that's far from the ventricle. That doesn't happen very often. So we're not using gliadel very often. However, these are questions that an experienced brain tumor program and surgeon will understand. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. So throughout the presentation, um, you know, you've talked about how these treatments can be used for glioblastoma, brain mets, or other uh, malignant conditions. Are any of these treatments applicable for someone who might have a benign brain tumor? So the answer is absolutely. In fact, one of the biggest misconceptions is that radiation or chemotherapy is not used for benign growths. To remind you, a benign growth is one that technically doesn't metastasize or move to another location. A benign tumor may grow in size, but it doesn't have the biological aggressive behavior as a malignancy or a cancer. What's a, uncommonly known is that even meningiomas, which are benign tumors, pituitary tumors, which are benign tumors, other types of tumors like uh, craniopharyngiomas or chordomas, these are all very common uh, benign growths that we commonly use radiation and sometimes brachytherapy on. So the answer, the direct answer to your question is absolutely. Many of our meningiomas, grade one or grade two, and obviously grade three, which is the most malignant and the rarest, we reserve radiation to prevent their growth. And in a grade one meningioma, which is biologically benign, they can still grow and they can grow in the brain. They can wreak havoc in a patient if, if that meningioma is in a vital area 
like near an eye nerve. So the answer is yes. We do use radiation. We've used brachytherapy with uh, radioactive iodine in craniopharyngiomas. Uh, gamma tile is particularly good if you're looking at a recurrent grade two meningioma. Gamma tile are the collagen-based radiation seeds, and that is a particular nice interface with atypical meningiomas or grade two meningiomas. So there's a whole host of, of uh, techniques that you've seen here that are reserved not just for cancers, but benign growths as well. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. And for any of our listeners who are interested in, in finding a physician that might use gamma tile, um, gtmedtech.com actually has a physician locator that can you can use to see who might be using this type of treatment. So another question that we have here um, is asking, so, you know, you talked about how these treatments can delay or, or reduce the chances of recurrence. Someone here would like to know if there's any statistics on, on exactly how long such treatments might be able to prolong a reoccurrence. Well, it, the data is, um, we, we usually recite the data in medians. Now, median is different than mean. Mean is essentially an average of all patients. So if you have 100 patients, the average will be the, the, the average time it takes for 100 patients to show progression of their disease. Median is reserved for smaller number of patients and is commonly used in trials with glioblastoma. That's the middle person in that, in that curve. And so most of these trials, the, the interval median progression free survival is measured in months. For the gamma tile, for example, it was up to nine months. In Gliadel, it's approximately three months. In Novacure, which is the, the um, tumor treating field uh, therapy, it's a three months or so. So uh, unfortunately, in, in many of these treatments, our, our modalities are measured in months. We're excited, we're so excited because in our intra-arterial drug delivery trial with uh, a vast and upfront, our median was measured in 3.35 years. So I think we're going to be looking at a combination of these treatments as the right modality uh, to really push the needle. So we're measuring survival and median progression free survival in years, not months. Thank you. Another question we have here is geared towards the tissue flap therapy that you described. If you're using the omentum, does this pose a risk for inflammation in the resection cavity? Absolutely, and a great question. So there's risk to everything we do, right? And you may have heard that some institutions, my colleagues are putting polio virus, we're studying Zika virus. Um, frankly, any virus except coronavirus right now is, is being trialed as a way to get in and destroy cancer cells. But when we're rotating the, the tissue belly fat or omentum into the brain and we're bringing in this much immune cells, yeah, we hope that it interacts with the body's immune system where the cancer cell now becomes um, identified and that cancer cell gets identified by our immune cells. The immune cells go back into the wall of the immune system, tell all of its uh, helper and, and killer T cells, which come roaring back in to kill the cancer cell. Well, guess what? There is a risk, and we don't understand that risk entirely, um, and we have ways to turn down that risk if it were to occur. But yes, one of the risks is that we do have an immune response, but frankly, we, we've seen immune responses before. We can handle um, uh, immune responses, and if it ever got to the point where it was too much for the patient or there's too much swelling, we take out that tissue flap. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. Another question uh, we have here is just in general on necrosis. You know, you talked about the importance of trying to find treatments that can that can reduce necrosis. And we have a couple of listeners here um, who'd like to understand what exactly is necrosis and what risks does that pose to patients? So 
Necrosis is essentially like overwatering a plant. Um, you think radiation is good, you think watering a plant is always good, but if you over overdo it, you, you make the brain soggy and you can kill those cells with too much radiation. So we're very cautious about radiation-induced changes in the brain. Now, frankly, because we're seeing longer-term survivors with glioblastoma measured in years, we're seeing a little bit more of the side effects of the radiation that, that was generated years ago. So the radiation treatment that was designed, really, we didn't expect patients to live longer than 12 or 15 months. Now we're seeing, so the long-term effects of radiation weren't directly understood, nor were they seen or, or um, visualized because the patients weren't living that long. Now with that same radiation regimen, we're seeing patients live three, five longer years, and we're seeing radiation-induced changes. With radiation necrosis, you actually see cell death. You see brain cells that die. And these are not cancer cells. These are brain cells. So the, the patient can have um, radiation-induced changes that can make her weak in the left leg if her right brain is radiated and she develops radiation necrosis. Yes, there are drugs and steroids, decadron, a vast and a half the dose uh, can be used to uh, treat radiation necrosis. Um, so, um, but again, we want to make sure to limit a, the patient side effects by limiting the amount of treatment-related changes we call radiation necrosis. Thank you, Dr. Bukvar. That is all the time that we have for today. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you once again, Dr. Bukvar, for your wonderful webinar presentation. Aside thank from you, our, Ambrian. thank you. Aside from our educational webinar series, the ABTA has a variety of programs that help support patients and caregivers throughout their experience. For more information about ABTA's programs, events, and services, visit ABTA's website at abta.org, email us at info at abta.org, or call the ABTA Caroline at 1-800-886 two two eight two